Okay, we're going to get started. Thank you all for coming to our uh, Monday colloquium, holiday week. Hope everybody has a safe travel back and forth if you're going anywhere. It's a distinct pleasure to introduce my good, my best friend, Michael Morgan, and great colleague, Michael Morgan, uh, today's speaker. Michael's been with us since 1995, um, after getting his PhD with Kerry Manuel, I think in 1994, is that right? Yeah, 94 at MIT. He was an undergrad at MIT, too, so there's an MIT connection here that uh, everybody knows about in our department. But Michael's career has been um, very varied and exciting. Uh, besides being an outstanding teacher and mentor here at the University of Wisconsin for nearly a quarter of a century, and the, the, in his wake, the scholars who have come out of his group are really a stellar group, as you probably know. Um, but I won't spend too much time on that. But in addition to all of that, uh, over these two decades, uh, two and a half decades, he was an AGU fellow. Was it AGU? Yeah. Uh, or AMS? No, AMS. AMS fellow, where he worked with Senator Ben Cotton in, in his office in Washington for a year. And then he had four years as a rotator at NSF. Uh, and that, was, that ended in 2013, right? Yeah, I had to wait a full two years to go to the Union South because I made a vow to my friend that I wouldn't enter the building until he came back. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. And, um, and so during that time, you know, five years or so of Washington work, Michael accrued so many miles on Delta Airlines that he can now fly anytime and anywhere that he wants at a whim. In fact, there was one time when we were flying to a conference where my wife, Min, noticing Michael in the airport, said, uh, hey, you on the same flight as us? And Michael said, oh, no, 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 but I'm on the same plane. <laughs> you know Min's got a steel trap memory. She'll, right. she'll vouch for me on that. <laughs> no, I had a better response. <laughs> well, you had two. Okay, I'll tell you the other story. So, yeah, this was on the way home. The, the story on the way out on the same trip was Min was saying, so where are you sitting? Uh, and uh, Michael said, well, no, 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 you tell me first. Min said, we're in row 27. And he said, the numbers go that high? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, he's, he's got a great sense of humor, as you can tell. Um, but Michael's contributions intellectually have covered a huge amount of territory. They really have. And uh, spanning from an extremely highly cited paper with John Nielsen Gammon about using tropopause maps to explore uh, issues of mid-latitude weather systems, to PV diagnostics of frontogenesis and wave activity. Uh, it has an enduring fascination with adjoint models, we were joking about it beforehand, and the sensitivity to weather systems that you can discern from using them. So, uh, and that, that has been his, his big contribution to my intellectual development over some period of years, is I don't understand any of this except through him. And it's been really uh, excellent being at our weekly weather watch, just a little plug for that, because um, you know, over 10 years of weekly discussions of issues like this, you learn something. Uh, you can't help it. And so uh, this um, work with the adjoint models is not just to figure out stuff about uh, sensitivity and the interest in weather systems, but also aspects of predictability. So Michael's latest uh, adventure in this realm, he'll talk to us about today, and that's application of adjoint tools to understanding of tropical cyclone intensity intensity sensitivity. So take it away, Mike. Okay, thank you, John, for a uh, nice warm introduction. And I welcome and thanks for everyone for coming um, on this holiday week. I wasn't sure if we would have a great attendance, but now I get a chance to talk turkey to you about uh, a sensitive subject to me, um, adjoints. So um, we'll get started on this. Um, I have a couple ads in here also. Uh, first of all, just to sort of relate some of the things I've been working on and thinking about over the last, um, last few years or so. I've been both mid-latitude and tropical cyclone sensitivity research. Some of the work I'll be presenting today uh, was out group of work that um, uh, Zhao Zhang Ri He, who was a grad student working with um, Professor Liu before Professor Liu left, and um, Mr. He began working with me uh, for a while and did some work on uh, tropical uh, storm Irma, but also been working with Zoe Brooks Zipton as well as um, Greg Hoover on a lot of this work, and we've done some work with mid-latitude cyclones, Alex uh, Goldstein, as well as Craig Oswald. Um, open Carmar to our group. She's going to be working on some tropical cyclone work as well. But I've also been interested um, in looking at a sort of real-time uh, prediction of, for subseasonal forecasts as well as the forecast sensitivity with the limb, and hopefully at some point in the next year or so I'll be able to present some results of that work. Working, trying to expand into looking work in the private sector and development of forecast products, but also exploration of research opportunities that hopefully will benefit both undergraduates and graduate students. Um, a long-standing interest in, um, interest in science advocacy and policy, and maybe that's something that could be all certainly a future talk or seminar or discussion. Really gotten into Python, I really like that. And of course, I can't leave out weather challenge. 
hopefully some victories coming up on that. Oh, this sure. semester has been a little bit brutal to me because of the significant travel. But this talk is brought to you by 401801, Practical Numeric Weather Prediction. You may have seen a slide around uh, um, the hallways. But this is a class that will be offered uh, this coming spring. Um, it's going to be sort of limited enrollment, but talk to me about your interest in taking it if you're a grad student or an undergraduate because you know, we'll be looking at not just running the, the work as a model, and it'll be somewhat of a black box to a certain extent, but also learning some basic principles of NWP data simulation. Next fall, I believe I'll be doing a data simulation, full data simulation course, uh, but looking at also exploring some applications of NCAR's data simulation research testbed DART, as well as uh, their MET forecast evaluation tools, and also just exploring how to use NWP models and looking at the output, how to creatively um, interpret the output interrogate the output for um, useful purposes. So just something I'll bring up. But this title, this talk, is about tropical cyclone intensity sensitivity. And so at the beginning, I really want to be clear about what do I mean by sensitivity. Because it comes up in a number of different contexts. We look at climate change and the sensitivity of the Earth system to doubling CO2 and things of that sort. But I have a very specific intent in mind. Here, we're going to look at sensitivity as an estimate of the expected mm -hmm. change in a measure of an NWP, a numerical weather prediction model forecast of tropical cyclone intensity. Some measure of it, how does that measure change due to changes in the NWP, initial, uh, NWP model's initial state or its forecast state? So we look at sensitivities to the initial state of initial conditions or to uh, conditions along the forecast trajectory. The way to think about this, if we measure the intensity, it could be sea level pressure, it could be the kinetic energy of the wind field averaged about the cyclone center, we call that some scalar quantity R. And if we denote the initial state by this vector x naught, which contains all the information about the knowledge of the initial conditions of the system, then this sensitivity that we're calculating is in fact a sensitivity gradient, it's a derivative, more appropriately called a gradient, of the response function R due to changes in the initial state x naught. So that's an initial condition sensitivity. We could also look at sensitivities to a the forecast trajectory, along the forecast trajectory. Now this specific sensitivity is most effectively and most efficiently calculated, most efficiently calculated using what's called an adjoint model, the adjoint of an NWP model. If you go back and think about the sensitivity, dr dx naught, x naught, the state vector, is on the order of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 components. <coughs> and so if you wanted to go through and change each individual component of the state vector, you know, create an ensemble once you just go through it each grid point each variable and perturb it, you have to do you know, 10 to the 7th or more model runs and look at the differences between the state, a control state, and perturbed state, to begin evaluating the sensitivity. That's, that's highly inefficient. But if you know which response function you're interested in, in this case we're going to be looking at a measure of the dry mass at the bottom of a column in the, the WARF model, um, that's going to be our R. If you know that specific response function you're interested in looking at the change, you can then use the adjoint model to compute with a four, single forward run and one backward run, costing about one and a half times the, the forward run. You can calculate this gradient for that specific response function. The adjoint of a linear operator, all linear operators can be represented as a matrix, is just simply the matrix transpose of that operator. And this might seem like a very obscure, or very not particularly useful statement to make, and maybe leave you you're know, scratching your head what that means. But what it actually does, it's a very powerful statement about how to actually go through and code up the adjoint of any sort of model. You can go line by line through each line of code. You have inputs to that line of code, you have outputs from that line of code. And if you basically, if you linearize the code, so that's one first step in this, you can then go back and transpo uh, write each line of code as a matrix, transpose that matrix, and then, we, then write it out, uh, the Fortran or Python or whatever the code it's written in. You can actually do this online. You can submit your code online, you submit it, it'll come back in a few seconds with the adjoint code. So you can actually take code that already exists and write that. Some of you that took um, a predictability course we took a few years ago learned about that. Um, and I imagine it's probably, you know, lots of grad students chained to their chairs that receive the code and they quickly do the computation and send it back. But it's actually some sort of a numerical process that was done. So that was a joke. But, um, so how do we relate? these different models. What's the relationship between a nonlinear forecast model like a WARF model or UK MET model or, you know, uh, Prairie Tripoli's um, UWNMS? We have some initial state represented as a vector that goes into this nonlinear model to produce a forecast state, XF. Now, 
we can take from that forecast state some particular quantity that we're interested in, some aspect of the forecast that we're interested in looking at, how is that aspect perhaps going to change to give us that response function we had mentioned earlier, or give us that gradient we mentioned earlier. And so we can define some response function at the final time which represents some scalar quantity that we're interested in. We'll put that off to the side for just a moment. We can take that nonlinear model, many of you that have taken 610 or 611, know about linearizing uh, models. In this case, we're linearizing about in a time-evolving forecast state. And that linearized model basically allows us to propagate forward in time an initial condition perturbation, x naught prime, to a final time state, x, xf prime. That's the linear model. It turns out that if we go line by line and transpose, you know, right as a matrix, this operation, line by line in your Fortran code, transpose it, we get what's called the adjoint model, which has information that flows in the opposite direction. It will take the gradient of our final time forecast state, the response function defined at a final time forecast state, and it will integrate it backward in time to produce a gradient of this response function with respect to the initial state. This and this calculation is key to coming up with these sensitivity gradients that we'll be looking at in a moment. So we have the forward model and the adjoint model that are used in this process. The tangent linear model can be used for other purposes, like checking out what the validity of assuming sort of a linearly, linear dynamics and evolving perturbations forward in time for the situation you're looking at. We can put that off to the side. We won't talk about this too much today, or all today. We can talk about it at the end if you're interested. But we'll be applying the nonlinear model to create the forecast and the forecast trajectory, saving it at each time step. We can define a response function at the final time. As long as it's a differentiable function of the model forecast state, this response function, we can define this. We input this into our adjoint model and integrate it backward in time. I'll be using a form of the wharf that was, I haven't written the adjoint for the wharf, but I'm familiar with the sort of the workings of it. Um, but you can take, again, any you know, model and write this adjoint out. It's somewhat cumbersome to go through all the checking, but it's cool. Sorry, John. does this uh, include uh, diabetic processes? Yes. Okay. It'll be a limited number of diabetic processes that are going to be available for the wharf model. There are more uh, sophisticated adjoints like the East and WF and the Coamps model, another local area um, mesoscale model that have more robust representations of the linearized and adjointed physics in them. But this is something that the WARF doesn't um, have. Yeah, I'm just trying to learn more about this. Um, so an, an adjoint method, when you when you use little time segments and you go forward or backward, you just trust that. You add them all together without any auxiliary information for correcting or deciding which way right. to go at all. Right, so the assumption in this, in this talk will be, one, that our forecast trajectory is pretty decent. We're assuming that the forecast trajectory is fairly accurate, it's accurately depicting what's, what's happening, and that the, since we've linearized this and we're taking the, you know, the transpose of this linearized model, that linear dynamics are going to be able to propagate perturbations forward in time reasonably well. We know it's not gonna be perfect, obviously diabetic processes, as John Young was mentioning, are kind of tricky, but we can go back and we can check that. We can put in, perturbations- In going in forward and backward, like in a common filter, you sort of have weights of forward and backward, you sort of do it a joint solution to use that technique in this effect? No, so there's no it? ensemble, yeah. you know, for the com there's no common, really a common filter-like approach. This is really just the linearized dynamics mm -hmm. that then transpose that provide us the, um, the adjoint model. Now the motivation for this isn't to talk, you know, this talk today isn't about, specifically about adjoints, but it's using adjoints as a tool to understand sensitivity of tropical cyclone intensity. So the motivation for this so there are three, you, know, you might imagine there are more, but three key questions that might be of interest regarding tropical cyclone intensity. I'm not going to talk about track because that's largely been, I think, a problem that's been, I won't say it's solved, but it's been ameliorated by um, advances in data simulation and effective sampling of the atmosphere um, and just better understanding of what, what governs tropical cyclone track, and those have been significant improvements in the last decade. So some questions might be, what's the maximum intensity a tropical cyclone might achieve in a given environment? If we know that, another question might be, what factors prevent a tropical cyclone from reaching its maximum intensity? And finally, you know, at what rate will a tropical cyclone change its intensity in a given environment? These are slightly different questions. Right? Now the focus for today is going to be on the first two. You might say that this, look, this first one, what is the maximum intensity a, a tropical cyclone might achieve um, in a given environment? That's, you know, people have done various flavors of what's called MPI, maximum potential intensity work that's been done by Emanuel, by Holland, and others that have looked at this issue. And I would say that it generally seems to give a good um, 
seems to do a pretty good job because if you look at MPI forecast broadly or MPI distributions on maps and then look at the maximum intensity that cyclones have achieved in given regions, it's very rare um, to see tropical cyclones exceeding this maximum potential intensity. And that's governed by some very basic thermodynamic ideas that um, allow you to come up with that calculation, whether it's with respect to wind or in terms of wind or in terms of sea level, minimum sea level pressure. This question, what factors prevent a tropical cyclone from reaching its maximum intensity, uh, Reamer et al. in 2010 talk about sort of the frustration of the energy cycle yielding a decrease in tropical cyclone intensity. So you know what the maximum intensity is, few storms reach that maximum intensity. What is it about the environment that's frustrating the ability of the tropical cyclone to advance toward its maximum intensity? This last question about the, tropical, the rate of change of intensity is something I'll leave for a later talk and for later work. Uh, some work that uh, Alex Goldstein did with mid-latitude cyclones and cyclone intensity change, we're going to begin applying to looking at uh, tropical cyclones. So these first two questions are closely related, and we'll kind of review in a very gross sense. I'm not going to go into full details about MPI, but look at the cycle, the energy cycle that's used to describe MPI, and look at what the concerns Reamer had, but I'll add on an additional effect, which is not thermodynamic, but dynamic, that would be of interest. So, you know, this notion of MPI comes from this Carnot view of tropical cycle energetics, in which you have sort of a quasi-closed loop of processes that occur in this. We have an inflow leg down here. Here's the ocean surface, and we have fluxes of moisture and heat in this inflow leg, which are allowing air parcels to acquire heat from the ocean. So we have sort of uh, fluxes off the ocean, from the ocean surface due to the thermodynamic disequilibrium of the air just above the ocean surface and the ocean surface. And this, as the air is drawn inward into the tropical cyclone, toward lower pressure leads to an increase in the theta E of the air parcels as they come in. These parcels then rise in a moist adiabatic fashion uh, in the eye wall and flaring outward at upper levels along this path right here. And you can look at these lines here representing different values of theta E. It's likely the maximum theta E that can be achieved and it's like the lower values that don't get quite as deep or as high up into the atmosphere. Okay, so that's C. And then when we get along this path, we get these uh, air parcels go into the outflow layer, they expand out at a very large radius, assume that they basically lose enough heat for radiated uh, cooling to return back to their ambient theta E of some environment, and that the angular momentum is also <coughs> along this path restored back to its value before it came in. There's a loss of angular momentum coming inward because of friction, frictional dissipation at the sea surface. And the cycle is ultimately closed along at some sort of fictional absolute uh, vortex line A, along which thermodynamic contributions are assumed to be small. So we have these adiabatic elements of this, and these are quasi-isothermal processes um, far in the outflow and at the surface. So this is the, the process. This is the cycle that you know, people have built some MPI theories around. And you know this inflow leg is sort of key to this, because it's this increase in theta E due to uh, flux of the moisture and heat from the ocean surface. During this, during this inflow leg. What Reamer et al. in 2010 suggested is that there's some possible sinks to this. The, they suggested that mixing of low theta E air, which is characterized or characteristic of the tropical atmosphere in the lower the troposphere, either into, uh, mixing into the eye wall or through convective downdrafts can help weaken the, this system. I would also add that the work that's done to expand this outflow um, layer anticyclone is also an important factor. That energy that's taken to expand this outflow layer anticyclone and this in, up, and then eventually out um, circulation is something that's unaccounted for in MPI. Um, former student of mine, Eric Reppin, uh, did some work on this. And you know, Greg, and Eric, and I uh, have a paper on that back um, a little over a decade ago. Look at how not accounting for that work can lead to some some issues. Mark? Yes. So the problem of the Carnot, Carnot cycle is basically work. Uh, work in joules per unit mass. Right. What is the linkage then from that quantity to intensity? How do you get from so, the amount of energy generated by the cycle to right. the intensity? So that energy that's generated is assumed to help um, spin up a balanced vortex. The vortex is a gradient wind and hydrostatic balance. And so you can get a maximum wind speed from that. And then if you make some assumptions about the structure of that vortex, you can convert that maximum wind speed to sea level pressure minimum. Okay, so you got an assumption about the dissipation of energy through friction right. through some assumption about the shape of the, or the intensity of the vortex and all that. Right. Okay. So, Reamer's idea about this thermodynamic frustration 
Uh, note that first of all, there is this characteristic theta E minimum in the tropical atmosphere in the mid to lower troposphere. And he suggests that the entrainment of some of this low theta E air from the mid troposphere into the, the eye wall helps disrupt the convection, weakening it, so it goes down to a lower theta E as you have this mixing process that occurs, and it ultimately weakens the cyclone. Secondly, you can also have this process in which you have convection that occurs in this in the I band region of the storm. That convection um, entrains some of that low theta E air, creates downdrafts, those downdrafts then sort of quench the inflowing air that's trying to gain its theta E. It's being mixed with these downdrafts, these pulses of lower theta E air that ultimately also weaken the theta E of the air that's in the inflow. Greg, did you have your hand? You're about to say something? What's that? I thought you had your hand your hand up earlier. Okay. No, I don't think I did. Okay. Or it may be by mistake. Okay. So this, this, you know, the down. So this low theta E air is going to be is perhaps either mixing with the eye wall or in downdrafts that occur in the convection can help weaken this tropical cyclone. And then likewise, this other dynamic. That's a thermodynamic frustration. This is a dynamical frustration that the expansion of this outflow layer and the formation of this anticyclone that's characteristic of um, developed or developing tropical cyclones is at the expense of the primary circulation. It has to do work against this environment as it pushes out. The work is dependent on the difference between the angular momentum of the outflow and that of the far environment. You can characterize that related to the potential vorticity of the, of the environment. The resistance to the outflow expansion is related to the inertial stability of the outflow layer, that is sort of the absolute vorticity in that layer. So any process that can lower the environmental potential or absolute vorticity in the outflow layer will allow a hurricane to reach a greater intensity. Because if you can make the work that has to be done to expand this outflow into the anticyclone and spin up the anticyclone, you can make it easier for that to occur. That means there's less work expended doing that, and that the residual of that work relating to um, Grant's question can lead to the more efficient and effective spin up of the hurricane vortex. And so we're going to explore some of these ideas through the use of adjoint results and see how they this leap link into this. I'm not saying there's, a, there's firm conclusions here, but there's a lot of evidence that some of these ideas can be viewed from the and adjoint any, results. Any, any kind of just you know, broad argument you can make for how important this might be in terms of like a scale analysis of some kind? I haven't tried that, but that's, there probably is a way to to frame it, um, to frame it that way, I can't. I can't speak to a solution to it right now. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So the subcomponent of the dynamical frustration that involves a second partial secondary eyeball formation and uh, maybe a contraction and reforming the inner eyeball. How do people view that? Is at first it seems like it could be diminishing the hurricane, but then later on it will strengthen it. So and then there's ideas about the downflow mm -hmm. it helps concentrate the updrafts and are a key for intensification. So it's, it's I think it, it's the nature so of the downdrafts. Um, if they're carrying this low theta E down to the surface, that's going to ultimately weaken the storm, at least until you've, you've gotten rid of the downdrafts by somehow moistening that air in the um, in the vicinity of the tropical cycle. We'll see some evidence for that. This notion of the uh, sort of these eye, the secondary eye walls that form that um, that can ultimately sort of uh, choke the inner eye wall and then lead to some temporary weakening before things contract. You'll, we'll see some evidence in some of this, the animations I'll show later on that there may be a process that's akin to that that's actually visible in the sensitivity gradients, but maybe we can come back to that question at the end. The other thing with um, eyewall replacement cycles I would mention would be that they t tend to occur once the system's already reached Category 3 strong intensity. Okay. So it's already attained a fairly intense vortex at that point. So a lot of that work has been done, um, and then the ERCs kind of can take over. Right, and I wonder if those are triggered by some external process that either temporarily disrupts where the outflow is going or where the new updrafts could form that can then allow at a larger radius more ascent and then eventually these things contract again. So there's, I think, some interesting questions that will hopefully, this will, be, will leave you with some interesting questions, maybe not solutions. So the case we're going to look at is uh, Hurricane Irma from uh, last season, uh, from 2017. You can see it began as a Cape Verde storm and then moved westward across the Atlantic and eventually impacted the uh, Northeastern Caribbean, and then northern Cuba, and eventually the uh, southern United States. We're going to focus on one aspect of this track. This will be centered around the 5th of September, during which time this cyclone went, underwent some rapid intensification. As part of a synoptic overview of the event, we have these four panel maps. These are just taken from the GFS analyses. These aren't from forecast. Um, that show mean sea level pressure and wind in the just to give you a sense of the structure of the storm and the environment. 
in the upper left, we have shear taken over from about 200 millibars to about 850 millibars for a deep layer mean shear um, that are shaded here. But also, the you can see the shear vectors that anticyclonic circulation. Lower left is just relative humidity average from, I believe it's 300 millibars down to about 700 millibars. This is the relative humidity. You can see the scale at the bottom. And then also the winds. And then finally, this is the potential vorticity in a layer from about 100 to 200 millibars near what I would presume would be the optimal. This is an environment. You can see that there's very little wind shear near the storm at this time, zero zero on the 5th of September. Okay, the shear that you do see here is largely due to the fact that this is a warm core vortex and it's going to transition from a strong cyclonic circulation at low levels to a very brisk anticyclonic circulation aloft. In terms of the upper tropospheric environment, it's characterized by relatively low values of potential vorticity. You see some of these whites and yellows here. But there's still a lot, at least in this analysis, some of these green areas, which are sort of more modest values of PV, which the lower the PV, the lower the, um, broadly speaking, the lower the inertial stability. But there's no clear obstacle for this, perhaps, the cyclone to really begin in, uh, to undergo some sort of rapid intensification, which actually did occur. We'll see in the sequence of images that this outflow expands rapidly. You'll definitely get a sense that the PD is lowered, at least in these analyses. You know, one complicating factor here in the lower troposphere ahead of the tropical cyclone is this region of drier, lower relative humidity. That can be a hindrance, and we'll see what happened there. It did intensify, so this wasn't a big deal. But perhaps if it weren't here, it would have intensified more rapidly. We'll, we'll get some, perhaps see some evidence for that. So I'll just step ahead. These are every 12 hours. Okay, so this is the first, and I'll just go back so you can see. I mean, focus on what's happening here at the outflow. You can also see the potential vorticity in this layer is getting lower. These areas are getting sort of smeared out, sheared out by the flow. Go ahead, another time step, zero zero on the sixth. This vast area of low potential vorticity is now lower than it was earlier, and that's a function of its intensifying, but the you know, convection has helped to. Um, expand this anti-cyclone. The outflow is real well established on this cyclone. There's no real um, synoptic feature that's really in the way for this to, to stop it from intensifying even further. So this underwent some rapid intensification. And there's still this little tongue of slightly drier air that's to the west of the cyclone center that's moving this direction. But again, the cyclone vortex may have spun up so well that the vortex itself is inertially stable so that it can't in, you know, impingement of drier air from the sides of it are being restricted. So this is actually a good condition for this to intensify. So what we're going to do <laughs> is use the wharf model and its adjoint, including 40 uh, evenly spaced vertical levels, a 30 kilometer grid space. You just have warm microphysics in this. Uh, large scale condensation is allowed. We've initialized it with a, the GFS final analysis on a quarter degree grid. And we're looking at a 24 hour forward forecast, 24 hour back adjoint forecast. I'll first show you just a series to simplify some of the graphics that I'll show you. What I've done is done some as beautiful averaging based on the center of the storm. This was also my entree that was using Python, sort of figuring some of these things out myself. So I'm proud of these images, although I know the sign error somewhere, but, which would be obvious, but I'll fix it. Um, so here's a tangential wind. Here is the radial average. This is the as beautifully average radial wind in in my convention, I'll call it my convention, because it's an, an error, a Morgan bug, <laughs> is positive and out is negative. That's fixable. And then we have the equivalent potential temperature. This is just a snapshot at one time, and this is relative humidity as well. Okay? And you can see a couple things at that 12 hour forecast time. Really strong lower tropospheric um, cyclonic flow inward right here, which is consistent with what you would expect. This broad anticyclone that's formed on average around the cyclone center. A well-established inflow and outflow that characteristic theta E minimum in the lower troposphere. And then in return to relative humidity, you know, this dry air on average, about 400 kilometers or so away from the center, a little bit drying in the eye itself, but fairly moist in the eye wall. So you can see where the eye wall is. Again, this is a very crude representation of a storm with a 30 kilometer grid. You're not going to resolve the full structure of it, but this at least is a first step to give us some insight into some of the dynamical issues related to it. So this just shows the evolution every three hours um, of these average fields. You can see the establishment of really um, brisk outflow um, in the upper troposphere, intensification of that anticyclonic uh, circulation aloft, the inner core being moistened, and the theta E 
uh, minimum kind of remains, but it gets a little bit further from the center of the storm as this begins to, as the cyclone intensifies. And you can see the warmer inner core is this higher theta E comes further down in the eye, or the model's depiction of what the eye would look like. So I think a pretty decent spin up of the storm. It didn't get anywhere near the actual intensity of the storm, and I'll have those numbers handy at the end. I have a slide that shows that. But we're interested in sensitivities, not this forward forecast. So what do we do? We're going to identify a box. This is the entire model domain. We're going to put a box centered on the cyclone position at 24 hours. And we're going to define the response function as a variable in the model, which is called mu prime, which is really the perturbation dry air mass in a column that's um, at the bottom of the model atmosphere. And so it's integrated all the way from the bottom up to the top of the model at 50 um, millibars. And it's a 20 by 20 um, grid point box centered on this. So we're going to look at the average value of this quantity, which is called mu, or minus mu. We're putting the minus sign in there so that this response function that gets larger means the cyclones intensify, just to make it easier to think about it. So if R gets bigger, that means the cyclone's gotten more intense. That means the sea level pressure, since the pressure at the top is fixed, the sea level surface pressure is gone down. Just a note, our model has these variables as in state vector, you get the W, theta prime, P prime, mu prime, which is that surface variable, and then the water vapor in your QV. The liquid water, I'm not following that in there, but you can also add liquid water there. So the corresponding adjoint will give us sensitivities to U, V, W, theta prime, P prime, U prime, and the water vapor. So we can look at sensitivities to these variables. So the first thing I'll show you is just one uh, image that shows the sensitivity of the water vapor at the initial state. So again, the cyclone was moving to the east, west, northwest. This at the initial time, it was poorly forecast or poorly initialized in this model. It was just below 996 hectopascals. And what's shown here are two sensitivities. Again, these uh, contours here just show sea level pressure so you get a sense of where the storm center was located. The red vectors here are sensitivities to wind. I took the U and V sensitivities and just created a vector from them. Sensitivities to U, sensitivities to V. So what that means is, if I were to perturb the wind at this grid point right here, made it stronger from the northwest, at this point, that would lead to an increase in the intensity of the cyclone 24 hours later. So if I perturb the wind, in the direction of these vectors, that would lead, or should lead, to an increase in the cyclone's intensity 24 hours later. That's number one. If I were to perturb the water vapor mixing ratio, anywhere where it's green, and you can see largely it's green everywhere around here, there's very few places where it's, these sensitivities are negative in these um, more sandy colored regions. If I make positive perturbations to water vapor in this region, this should lead in 24 hours to a more intense cyclone. Okay. These sensitivities tell me what I have to do to perturb it. It doesn't tell me the why, but it tells me if I did that and the dynamics are correct, that's going to lead to a more intense cyclone. So, these are, I'm sorry, these are, this is that um, like 0.98 sigma, so it's pretty close to the surface. These are lower tropospheric. Thanks for that question. So first of all, note that the sensitivities are maximized near Irma, but not, they're kind of centered on the position of Irma, but at some radial distance, at least for these two variables. And this is the whole model domain. These sensitivities aren't all over the place. This tells me that these are the regions and in initial conditions where wind perturbations to the level of, of my, I've chosen for these contouring, uh, where these are going to be most significant. If I make impacts here, that will lead to a more intense cyclone. If I perturb the winds over here, it's going to have no impact on the, the intensity of the cyclone in 24 hours. Yes, Brent. Is the, the banded structure of any significance, or do you think that's just kind of the adjunct convection here? I would say it could be of significance. I mean, you'd have to really look. We make perturbations from these and put them into the model. But I mean, it would be important to say that if you had to somehow sample this, if you're given the job of sampling, you probably want to sample, and you know your assimilation system is going to be fairly accurate and can resolve these gradients, that you'd probably want to sample where it's the most sensitive, you'll have the biggest impact in these regions if you think you need more data in these regions, where it's the larger values are as opposed to where it's slightly weaker. <clears throat> Those gradients do say that it's more you're more sensitive if you hit the model here as opposed to where it's slightly less sensitive. Yes. There. Intensification is pressure? The, yes, see the surface pressure, right. Okay. And so this variable is saying perturb the water vapor mixing ratio in the lower troposphere, these are also lower tropospheric values at roughly the same level where the winds are. If you perturb values here, you'll get an impact 24 hours later on the surface pressure. 
And if you perturb the winds in this cyclonic fashion, right, you can see there's also, broadly speaking, a broad cyclonic turning to the wind, the, wind, the implied sensitivities, these aren't perturbations, but the implied perturbations suggest putting in more cyclonic circulation here to get an intensification. Okay, so these are perturbations, and I'm, I'm thinking- Sorry, sorry sensitivities. Sensitivities, okay, right. but your sensitivity to perturbations. Right. In a, in a sense that is completely decoupled from other things happening that might be coupled with changes in wind speed. So in other words, we're not enforcing any, and this came up in an earlier talk, I, I forgot who gave it, but uh, there was a fairly long discussion about how if you're perturbing the winds, you're either putting it out of balance or you have to perturb other things in conjunction with like the pressure field. Right. So is there a conceptual difficulty in interpreting what it means to, to say this is sensitive to perturbing the wind if you're doing it in a way that is not dynamically linked to the things that are related to wind increases? Right. It's No, you can perturb just the winds and this will lead to an increase in density. And I, we have some perturbation experiments I'll show you okay. at the end which do that. Um, if you want to make more balanced perturbations, you don't radiate lots of gravity waves and kick your model into some weird thing. It's, you know, you could couple that with a mass perturbation, temperature perturbation to make everything balanced. But you can focus solely on the winds and focus solely on the temperature and focus solely on just the mixing ratio. Right, the sensitivity to mixing ratio implies what a perturbation to mixing ratio should look like. Yeah, well, mixing ratio makes sense because you can change that without changing other things. Right. The wind, but the wind and the pressure temperature right. is sort so of related to this. Um, I'm making an ad uh, in July of in uh, Jazz, I have a paper on this balanced adjustment when you integrate backward in time, and it shows that you can actually see that these sensitivities to wind and temperature often actually do exhibit some sense of a thermal wind-like balance that had previous, uh, previously not been reported in this. So there is some link to this notion of balance dynamics, but not talk, that unfortunately won't be the focus of today's talk. So cyclonic circulation removed from the center of the tropical cyclone at the initial time will lead to more intense TC in 24 hours. Sensitivities to water vapor, the green areas, mean if I make perturbations, positive water vapor, water vapor mixing ratio perturbations where it's green, that leads to more intensification. But this really does not explain the why part of this. Is it an annulus because there's a kind of a time window for induction? So if you were to do sensitivity for a shorter time, there you up. Oh. So <laughs> here's what's happening. Here's the sensitivities. These are every three hours going out to the final time. You see a couple of weird things that show up here. Okay, a lot of these vectors are, are partly an adjustment process that's occurring <coughs> at the initial time that the model I'm specifying a pressure-like variable at the surface as being my uh, response function and the gradient of that gets put into the model. I don't specify wind or anything else. And so there is an adjustment that occurs at the beginning. My response function is a box that's simply the, the pressure in this box at the surface. <coughs> You'll see that this <coughs> sensitivity to water vapor begins to assume the shape of a box that's partly due to the dynamics of just the backward integration of the adjoint, sort of forcing that structure on it. But the initial structure is something we've seen in a couple other cases that Zoe's been looking at uh, for Hurricane Harvey of last season as well. Um, but part of this is constrained by the, the what the uh, initial response function is. But we can show that when we make those perturbations in this annulus, we do get a more intense cyclone. And you can see this is the control forecast trajectory of the cyclone as it's intensified. But notice this contraction of both the wind sensitivities as well as the mixture ratio sensitivities toward the center. How much of that is due to this is how we specify the shape of the response function box and how much of it is, you know, a lot of this is due to the dynamics of the situation, the swirling circulation bringing things together. Why do we suddenly get sensitivity to wind all over the entire domain? Because at the very in first instant in time, or when we begin integrating backward, I've only specified sensitivities to, to surface pressure effectively and there is a dynamical imbalance, and so the, it's, it's like a geostrophic adjustment process going backward mm -hmm. in terms of sensitivity fields. So it radiates these gravity waves out very rapidly. <coughs> you could probably filter this out if you start off with a sensitivity field. In fact, I know you could filter this out if you start off with a sensitivity field that had wind and pressure and everything put together. I haven't done that yet, but that would happen. John? This is over a sequence of how many hours? 24 the, hours. And these are extreme, 24. right. But then the sensitivity is always defined as a 24-hour window of sensitivity, right? Right, so these sensitivities are the first image of sensitivity to the initial <coughs> condition, the next one sensitivity to three-hour forecast, sensitivity to the three-hour state, to the six-hour state, to the nine-hour state, so we're getting closer to oh, yeah, the final time. Oh, it's collapsing. Right, oh, right. Okay. So it's this is collapsing. As we go forward in time, this basically represents a shorter backward adjoint integration. Now, looking at sensitivities to wind are nice. We can see some sense that they indicate cyclonic perturbations. We can actually calculate sensitivities to things like vorticity, divergence, 
uh, stretching deformation and shearing deformation in the coordinate system we're in. The D1 and D2 are those uh, deformations. You can actually, you know, the form of these calculations you can actually get by inverting a Poisson type equation uh, using SOR or some other types of routines. I think what I'm going to probably do is, if you're interested, I can talk about this. I have the, the slide that describes this process, but it's kind of neat and involves a minimization of a cost function using steepest, uh, steepest ascent or conjugate gradient type method to get the, the answer. But what's more interesting, I think, are the actual sensitivities to vorticity. So rather than looking at the lower tropospheric levels of 850 millibars, look at the sensitivity to vorticity of 850 millibars. That's the initial state. Here's the vorticity in red. These red blotches are just local vorticity maxima. This is the vorticity in the analysis, essentially, of Irma. This broad red area is the sensitivity to vorticity which means, since this indicates positive values, anywhere in this region, if I were to increase the vorticity at 850 millibars at the initial time, that would lead 24 hours later to a more intense cyclone. If I were to make the vorticity anywhere in this region anticyclonic, and put in anticyclonic perturbations in this region, which spirals in anticyclonically toward the center of the storm, this kind of spirals in cyclonically to the center of the storm, but negative vortice perturbations here, this would also lead to a more intense cyclone 24 hours later. I'll talk about this at the end, this type of structure. But this is really, to give a hint at it, these inward spiraling anticyclonic like features are very closely related to what's called the aura mechanism in shear flows. If you have a shear flow, and it also it's related to sort of a PV or vorticity superposition argument that leads to an intensification by bringing like sign vorticity anomalies closer together by the shear flow. So if I make perturbations here or here, and then allow them to evolve in the shear flow, they'll kind of unwind and um, congeal to give a much more robust cycle. So make perturbations here, you'll get a stronger cyclone 24 hours when it's moved to there. So notice that structure. Let's look at the animation of these. Sensitivities is six hours. This is 12 hours. You can notice this kind of becomes just make it more Cyclonic vorticity everywhere in this region is going to lead to a more intense cyclone. That may not be too surprising. This is just 18 hours, so six hours to go to that final time. Make the vorticity anywhere in this region more cyclonic. That'll lead to a stronger cyclone six hours later. And this is three hours later, so it looks it kind of makes sense. Make it spin up the vorticity and just move it and it into this region. That'll give you a stronger storm. So not particularly insightful in the lower troposphere. How about the upper troposphere? We're talking about this outflow. This looks like a mess, right? This is 100 hectopascals. It says make it positive here, make it negative in some of these regions. Maybe there's some boundary issues with this. Here's the vorticity associated with cyclone in the upper troposphere. It's a weekly cyclonic there. And if I go forward in time, uh, so shorter adjoint integrations, some of these structures still rem remain, but then something curious happens. In that six to 12 hour period, this is using this minimization routine, and I checked it and double checked it and did it a couple different ways. By the time you get to 12 hours back, or a 12 hour backward integration, not only back to the initial time, but just back 12 hours from the 24 hour time, you begin to see these broad areas of negative sensitivities to vorticity, suggesting that in this layer where we have the outflow, if we weaken the inertial stability, make it less inertially stiff, we can have, this would lead to a more intense cyclone. So I should be more explicit. It says nothing about inertial stability, it says simply reduce the vorticity in the outflow layer in these regions, which are kind of on the first where we saw some of the stronger PV gradients in the earlier maps to the basic state, make it less cyclonic in these regions, that will lead in the upper, in the, at 100 millibars, that will give rise to a stronger cyclone 24 hours later. My interpretation of this is that you're weakening the inertial stability in the outflow layer, leads to more intense cyclone. Could this be just in that circle in the middle around the disturbance, the tropopause has just suddenly sprung to a higher elevation? Can you do a, a sensitivity to tropopause site? That's possible. I'd have to look at how to, to frame that question, but it's yeah. something that conceivably could be done, or I could interpolate those sensitivities mm -hmm. onto the dynamical trope. Because the geometry is exactly like mm -hmm. one of the prior uh, slides you showed, where yeah. you have this, this zero PV, <clears throat> or near zero PV. And so, yeah, so this area right here is precisely where we saw some of the stronger gradients that remain. Yeah, in right. Where the high PV began to set up. So that's and like you a had, weak you event. Know, you know, the thing about this is, though, shouldn't you be doing this along an isentropic upflow surface? I could do I could do that. That would be the next step to sort of clean this up, interpolate yeah. these sensitivities onto isotropic. And, and in, in reality, when you do that, it's probably 
probably precisely related to the potential vortices right. as opposed to the vortices. Vortices, right. Yeah. right. So this is just a surrogate for that. Right. For so that. This seems perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Did you get at the scale analysis question that I asked earlier in terms of how important these different things are by looking at like, what the standard deviation in these quantities is and multiplying by the sensitivity? You like could, that. if yeah, you could look at the yeah, so the implied yeah, size of the vorticity perturbation that you have to make in order to reduce the vorticity in the outflow layer. Look at maybe I'll let you. I may not get quite getting your question. Maybe another way I of looking I'm at it. I'm just thinking like how important is this actually like compared to compared to like say the mid-level moisture. Uh, right. If you do low-level winds. Okay. And, so one way to get at it might be looking at the characteristic size of either analysis or forecast errors of this quantity compared to the, the implied size of the perturbation okay. that would give rise to a you know one millibar change or an eight millibar change to the cyclone. I could perturb the moisture field by this amount, and this would give me a and by a certain amount, by the, based on the characteristic size and sensitivity to water vapor mixing ratio, and that will give me an 8 millibar change. Or if I change the vorticity in the outflow layer, if I had some idea of the characteristic size of the air there, you yeah. could yeah, you could probably That's do some I was sort saying, of look at the analysis. Standard deviation of those and do some kind of so you could get it. You get at comparatively how important. What's important? That's right. Yeah, yeah that would be certainly doable. This is just an azimuthal average of these quantities. Um, you can see the contraction of the sensitivity to vorticity as we get closer, get to shorter times, it's pretty broad. And if we blow the soybeans come in, notice up in here, from time to time it does go negative in the upper troposphere. And so that's, again, I have, we have to look at lots more cases for this to be a, a robust result, but I think it's at least consistent with some of the things that we had anticipated. Okay, so this is sensitivity to vorticity, radial height, uh, shown radial height. Next, this is looking at sensitivity to, we're going to look at sensitivities to the winds, the wind components that have been as youthfully averaged, both the radio as youthfully averaged wind and the um, tangential wind also being averaged. And just to get back to this notion of, well, what's this you know, transpose that we're talking about, if I know at each grid point the as youthful average, the as youth, the, uh, tangential wind and the radial wind at a given grid point, I could, through a rotation of my coordinate axes, figure out the actual U and B components relative to the Earth. And it's just through this coordinate transformation. This is, so the definition of a vector is any set of numbers that transform themselves like a position vector would be transformed when you rotate the coordinate system. So my forward model would be, give me these radial, um, tangential and radial winds, I can come out with U and B components of the wind. The adjoint of this involve sensitivities, give me the sensitivities to U and B, I give you sensitivities to tangential and radial components of the wind, and all I've simply done at each grid point would be to undergo this, you know, transpose this matrix. This is a very simple example. But it was in, in the service of trying to understand what we're seeing here. These are sensitivities to the as youthful wind, so that's the tangential wind about the vortex, and sensitivities to the radial wind, this in and out circulation that we see. Do you, do you find there's any issue with ellipticity of the pressure contours and trying to do an azimuthal average? I'm just doing problem? it straightforward. It may not be perfectly axisymmetric, okay. but I'm just saying I'm going to be brutal and just integrate, go out from the storm center, fix distances, and then radial average, or azimuthally average this quantity. So what we see here, the sensitivities to wind are maximized at some distance from the center, and over time, the sensitivities to this tangential wind that's built in, you can see them gradually migrating inward. And this reminds me, and I'm not an expert at all by any stretch on um, sort of eyewall replacement cycles, things like that, but you often see these max, wind maxima beginning to propagate inward toward the center of the storm. Maybe there's something, this is somewhat related to that, you put some sort of disturbance out from the center of the storm that's cyclonic and allow it to gradually migrate inward. You begin to see an increase in the, if you increase the tangential winds out here, you'll get a more robust cyclone at a later stage. For the radial wind, it's really unclear what's happening here. We can see this increase in the inflow right here. Not much of the outflow, but it's very messy until you get to just the last two or three frames, which are you know, six and three hours backward integration. And that suggests perhaps this must be a very strong gravity wave type response at the initial time. I don't think this, there's much to this yet. 
Um, so sensitivities to the radial wind are kind of incoherent until you get really close to a very short backward adjoint integration. But increases to the primary circulation in an annulus about tropical cyclone will increase the intensity at a later state. We'll wrap this up. These are sensitivities of water vapor. We saw that. This was in the near surface water vapor. We've seen these. Look at the azimuthal average, uh, not the azimuthal average, we'll look at another level, 850 millibars. To recall, we saw that area to the west of the cyclone that was dry. This is looking at the water vapor mixture ratio. These lower values here, we saw the relative humidities here were low. The sensitivity to water vapor at the initial time says, you know, indicates that if you were to make it more moist in that annulus, but also is at a higher level than being close to the surface, in this region out to the west of the cyclone primarily, where we see some of the driest air, that if you were to make it more moist here, that would lead to a more intense cycle. Mm -hmm. So in terms of how could this be useful, if you thought your analysis of water vapor in this region were poor, this would say if you had to devote resources to sampling the environment of the storm because you're in, concerned about intensity change, it's in this region as well as in this annulus that you would want to sample if you had regions of reason to suspect that the analysis of these regions was poor. Was poor. These dry areas out here and here aren't going to have much of an impact south of the cyclone, but it's really just the area just to the west. It's kind of neat that that picks up. So the G4 flights that, that do the, uh, the observation sample right. PCs, they obviously take that into account. So when, right. they, when they set up their flight patterns, um, they have several legs that will, because they can't fly to the core with the G4, but they'll get as close as they can to the core to try to sample those regions mm -hmm. in between those bands where that dry air might be located. I'm not sure if there are any observations going into this here. Analysis yeah, this is using, yeah, so this was just using the, the GFS analyses. I haven't looked at the actual observations that were taken by, right. by those aircraft. That would be another interesting part of the study. So here's the, the sensitivities to water vapor and temperature. Um, they indicate increase the water vapor in the, within the eye itself at the initial time, or in this region very close to the surface or very near to the eye wall here. Similarly, make it much warmer very close to the surface out here and in a region just outside the eye wall over time. So what these both suggest, if you combine, making it, you know, these, these sensitivities imply perturbations, which subsequently imply, make it more moist, make it uh, warmer, saying something about the theta E in these regions. So both of those things actually seem to depend on, for forecasting purposes, you have, it really comes down to having a really good parameterization of the service flux, both latent heat and sensitive right. heat. And so it seems like that would mean you really want to get that nailed down well to have, right. a, have a chance. Assuming the model is, is well right. was well formulated, it points to these are the reasons where you want to um, mm -hmm. get the biggest bang. So this is theta E in the fill pattern. This is sensitivity to water vapor that's shown right here. And it's indicating you want to make it, the, the sensitivity patterns say that if you were to make it drier here, make it more negative. These are positive sensitivities that would weaken the storm and make it more moist in this region where we have the minimum of theta E broadly just outside the eye wall, that's going to lead to more intense cyclone. This is at the initial time. At the final time, as the cyclone spun up, this is less expansive outward, but it's in this column that's surrounding the storm. You want to make it more moist in that column, and it doesn't really care too much about what's going on much further out. That's, a, that's actually for just three more hours of integration to get a stronger storm. Does that tell you something about the time scale over which the fluxes actually matter to if get you, to the eye? Right, so if you can follow, you know, do some trajectory analysis of the speed of which these lower troposphere features are, are moving in, yeah. you could probably figure out how much more moist would, how much more moisture would you have to put in, in this region, to create a perturbation of this size, and right. figure out what the flux yeah. would be. Yeah. Brett? Do you also project those sensitivities onto the surface fluxes? Because so far, kind of typically with a lot of it, it just looks like you're you're entraining the low level air into the. Into the Right, so we haven't done looked at the surface fluxes explicitly as resolved by the model or the model representation of those. Does, you, does your adjoint project onto the surface? It has an adjoint of the boundary layer scheme, so it should have some mm -hmm. knowledge of this of the, the surface fluxes. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just looking at what, uh, relative humidity and sensitivity to mixing ratio. I'm going to skip that for just a moment. Very last thing I want to talk about. Every, all that I've shown you right now basically sort of hints at if I make a perturbation of this <coughs> sign in this location, I'll get this impact. And you can actually calculate what that impact is going to be. You have a sensitivity gradient. You have the perturbation that you want to make. Calculate this dot product. That gives you an estimate for the change in the response function. Okay, so we can actually figure that out. And if it works well, that tells you that linearity is going to do what it does. If you run the nonlinear model forward, 
in time and look at the differences in the forecast trajectories in terms of what R is calculated. You can see compare the nonlinearly calculated delta R with this estimate that we got right here. But another way to sort of interpret these, maybe a more robust way, is to actually create perturbations in the model based on the initial condition, of the initial sensitivities, to run the model forward in time and then do diagnostics of the differences between the control forecast and the perturbed forecast. And that might lead to greater insight into how are these impacting the response function. We don't have a lot of time to show that, and this is still work in progress. But this shows um, sea level pressure during this, uh, the control simulation shown right here. And these are sea level pressure perturbations that were intended to intensify the storm by, I believe it was four millibars by 24 hours. A couple of things, this model run actually goes out to 36 hours. So why 36 hours? First of all, for the initial perturbations, we're making modest perturbations of about two, two and a half meters per second to the wind field throughout the entire domain. That's the largest value that we were perturbing with. It takes time, but eventually you begin to see the blue and red areas that begin to emerge. These are pressure perturbations here. So there's a shift to the cyclone position we get past 24 hours, and this continues to grow with time. So these perturbations that we're making to optimally intensify the cycle in terms of sea level pressure are actually doing what we expect it to do, and they're not just doing it in a transient fashion. Let's create some sort of disturbance which will, that 24 hours explicitly get this stronger and the whole thing just falls apart afterwards. It continues, it continues a sustained development. So this is perhaps indicative of some sort of balanced perturbation that's emerged from this forward run. It's something that's robust continue to intensify. In terms of the region where we wanted to make this, this is just a focusing in on the domain. At the final, you know, at the 24 hour time period, there is certainly a shift. This, the, the cyclones a little bit to the southwest or southeast, the perturbed cyclones to the southeast of the control forecast. But we're looking at sea level or changes in mu, which is, in, these are in uh, hectopascals, of about six millibars or greater. That's about a seven millibar pressure change to the cyclone in just a small, modest two and a half meter per second wind speed. Is that suggesting then that if the cyclone was in that shifted to the south and east, it would have a lower pressure? I mean, is it, is it a position issue? I wouldn't want to call it, but these aren't sensitivities. Now, these are actual, I perturbed the initial condition using okay. those sensitivities that led to a, a shift. Mm -hmm. You could then want to be, you know, the interesting <coughs> question would be, how do those perturbations create, what's the perturbation that's created that causes this to slow down or to be right. moved to the southeast? Right. There's, there's a lot more emotion, emotion That's right. So just a couple key results. Sensitivities to the horizontal wind field reveal that cyclonic perturbations in the horizontal wind field nearly centered on the cyclone location prior to the response function time results in a stronger cyclone. Sensitivities to vorticity confirm this, this interpretation and an oral-like mechanism at work, I'll show you that. Consistent with inertial stability arguments, um, both in the lower troposphere and the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere. This is an outflow layer. But also intensifying the vorticity in the mid-troposphere perhaps creates a more robust um, vortex, which is less um, penetrated into by drier air. Sensitivity to radio uh, flow shows no clear signal except for short length adroid integrations, those like the gravity wave structures. This war mechanism, the sensitivities um, have this sort of feature, this characteristic inward spiraling, anticyclonic spiraling inward. This is work by Nolan and Farrell in 1999 that looked at a vortex with a mean azimuthal velocity that was inward, which is a barotropic vortex with a radius of maximum wind in this, and they looked at what kind of perturbation would you want to put in to intensify this over some period of time. Their initial time optimal was this structure, which very much like what we're seeing in the adjoint. There's a close relationship to this. But this ultimately goes back to notions of vorticity superposition and the so-called war mechanism from 1907, which was for clean parallel shear flows. You want these things tilted up against the, the shear in order for them to develop. So that's a, yeah, I'm gonna to go too long on this. Sensitivity to water vapor basically indicated that we want to moisten the environment. Sensitivity to temperature said make it warmer in the far field, and collectively they indicated making increasing the theta e of the environment of a tropical cyclone would lead to a more intense cycle. So these are all consistent with what we expect, um, and so I wouldn't say this is you know groundbreaking, you know, breaking news. Let's you know talk about this, but I think it shows the utility of the adjoint in, in finding these things out. But I think it's also going to be useful for for the um, for adaptive observations uh, to remotely see if you're doing either remote sensing or in situ sensing, these sensitivities can dictate where you want to take those measurements to have the biggest impact. What my group is going to be doing next is sort of exploring these for a lot more cases and coming up with some um, ideas on what the structure of perturbation should be to intensify these cyclones and to see if this frustration idea, both thermodynamically and dynamically, um, is worth pursuing further.
Anyway, thank you for your attention. I know it's gone long, but welcome any questions. Good. To me, one of the greatest problems in tropical cyclone predictions is why are they so predictable? <laughs> and the, the, the thing, um, as I, as I you know, had these discussions with you, is that the um, ECMWF, the GFS, tend to capture there's going to be a big storm developing right. even a week in advance mm -hmm. in many cases. And it seems that it has a lot less to do with local variability than something on a very large scale that's, that's saying this storm will happen in this right. place at this time. Is there a way with ad joints to sort that out? Because this is more like a week or more down downstream. Right. Well, the thing about work that Diana Nelson did in the East Pacific looking at tropical cyclogenesis there, and she was using um, uh, some statistical techniques to see if you could come up with predictors for the development of these storms. And what we saw, and then some follow-on work that Brett did using adjoint models, that there's, yeah, if you get the environment correct, if you get the this jet, this easterly jet that's just south of Mexico in the East Pacific, if you get the structure of that right, there are, you know, this jet is impinged upon by perturbations which can rapidly extract energy and lead to cyclogenesis. Mm -hmm. So if you can get the broader scale um, tropical atmosphere, the wind field, the structure that lead to perturbation growth, those are well resolved. It just takes the right shaped, right configured perturbation to hit into that region to trigger growth. So maybe the models are getting the basic you know, jet structure right, and the shears that are right. I'm not talking about necessarily instability, but a transient growth type mechanism. If you get that right, it's just a matter of getting perturbation to, you know, in the easterly east. So that might that might actually be a good idea or a good result because uh, maybe those uh, instabilities don't last a long time. So you kick up an instability in over a, a 12 to 24 hour period. Perhaps that's going to kick something off, and that's probably the kind of predictability. That seems to be what's happening with these models. Right. I would say it's getting the large scale environment right and have which support certain types of, you know, these transient growth, I wouldn't call them instabilities necessarily, but transient growth mechanisms. That if you can capture that correctly, you're probably going to be able to get the predict, you know, the predictability of these disturbances that go up. But it may be base independent, you know, which types of perturbations are going to grow. But be specific, there seems to be something about the jet structure south of that. Yes. In thinking about uh, moving vortices, I've often thought that uh, there's an asymmetry in a lot of the dynamics as opposed to a perfect vortex that's circularly symmetric. And I mean, that's hinted at in all your work here. So a couple of questions that relate to this is, um, is this a direction to really go deeper into some of these storms on in terms of non-radial symmetric uh, non-circularly non symmetric, azimuthally symmetric dynamics. Um, I mean, we saw that the, of course, the environment that the hurricane was moving into had big radiance of right. moisture. But aside from that, um, is, isn't it true that a vortex is actually moving um, across the Earth's surface is going to have automatically uh, a very great deviation from symmetry? And it's only that if the vortex is extremely strong that um, the asymmetry will be overwhelmed by the symmetrical part of it. Yeah, I don't want to claim that these are you know perfectly axisymmetric for the purposes of just the presentation yeah. during this. Um, the averaging was just to clarify some of the, the structures that, that um, were significant. But it's clear when you look at the individual sort of plan form maps, the maps of these sensitivities, the structure of them, they're intimately tied to you know, things that are tilted up shear against the, the shear of the vortex itself. And those asymmetries of the vortex structure are going to be pretty important for the perturbations that are going to grow. Um, I don't know if that addresses part of what that's, you're saying. That's kind of it. And there's a related thing I'll just briefly mention. Mm -hmm. In addition to looking at intensity, could you not have a completely orthogonal uh, application of this concept to look for what the sensitivity for changes of storm track were? Yeah, so if you can identify the steering flow for the tropical cyclone, often done as a vertical average of the wind centered on the tropical cyclone location. In fact, I'd say that Brett's already done this. He's identified sensitivity of the steering flow by using a PV inversion type technique to isolate the 
instead of just doing an averaging of the U and D components of the wind to get rid of the special part of the flow, just remove the vortex and then do an inversion that gives you the, a hurricane free flow that's going to be due to the environment, but the sensitivity of the environmental flow that's doing the steering. And that can allow you to, to apply this for a very profitable Now, steering. even in this example, mm -hmm. in a way, your sensitivity analysis tells you more than just about how the intensity of the storm is changing. But also there was a distribution uh, around the storm, right. which would show you where the uh, center of the storm was going to be. It could, right. So there, we pick a given response function, and if we make perturbations based on the sensitivities of that response function, yeah. they are intended to influence that response function, but they're also going to have, certainly have an impact on other things like track, like average temperature in the region, because that, you know, it might move the storm in a different location. So, It'll definitely have the impact, or it should have the impact on the response function we've chosen, but there are also collateral effects that are going to occur that weren't intended. Any other question? A, a really naive one. Is the central pressure of our tropical cyclone due purely to 18 for the kilogram molecular weight of water mixture in a hydrostatic sense, or is it mostly due to um, <clears throat> You know, the pressure gradient force gives you centripetal acceleration, but you only go in a circle. That allows for lower pressure to occur. Is it dynamical, or is it just hydrostatic water vapor in the middle? Well, temperature too, right? I mean, temperature is probably good. I mean, the hydrostatic temperature, the decrease because of temperature, but there's also, there certainly is a water vapor contribution mm -hmm. to that as well. Yeah, I got 20 hectopascals mm -hmm. off a really naive calculation here for a lower pressure in the high. Due to water vapor. Water vapor. Gary Lackman has a paper about this where it goes beyond that. It even says, what, what, would you, what about when you rain out some of what used to be a gas? Oh, okay. And you lose mass in that mm. column. There's less gaseous mass in the column. Yeah, pressure would go Yeah, down. it goes down. So right. there's, there's things you can look at. I think he did. Oh. It's a tropical storm. You might have looked at a tropical storm, right. too. But the, I mean, to follow on to your question, if this wasn't, you know, I think John's response is probably better than what I, was, I would have offered. It also points out what's a good response function to define for cyclone intensity. Do you want to use sea level pressure? Do you want to use vorticity, do you want to use the um, you know, circulation around the cyclone, do you want to use uh, kinetic energy for the winds? That's what made me think of it, because if it's just water vapor, you need to regress on for sensitivity, mm -hmm. then that's the whole deal that it probably isn't. But you can do these different ones and you can compare them. I don't think the water vapor varies very much in the eyeball versus in the general tropics. It's only like a couple of millimeters in water Yeah, I don't know. Like I've so never really thought about it before. Impact. It's probably wrong. Yeah, I mean, just Any other questions? I suppose it's safe to say you know where he works. Right, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm here all week. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I'm you again, Michael. <laughs>